Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Good evening. I'm Lisa Cunningham, and on behalf of the Black Women's Health Imperative, I want to welcome you to tonight's program. You know, when the topic of Black health in America is discussed, the voices of our LGBT community are oftentimes not included, and it's painfully obvious when we look at the overall health disparities. But for this event, we are bringing together a group of change agents to share their experiences and shed light on what it will take for us to make real progress with regards to LGBTQ health in America for the future. First up, I want to bring up a special guest, um, Dr. Elijah Nicholas. Dr. Nicholas is a 24 year veteran, okay? He has a doctorate, three master's degrees, and by all accounts is a successful man. But for many years, he was holding a very, very deep secret. But today, he is here as a proud transgender man who transitioned in 2018, and he has written a children's book called Madoodle. Welcome, Dr. Elijah. It's so good to have you. How are you doing tonight in these unprecedented times? I am doing fantastic, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to this amazing organization and to the founder. It's just an honor to be here. You know, we are at the tail end, Dr. Elijah, of Minority Mental Health Month. And I know you sit here today happy and proud, but take me back to 24 years ago when I know that was not the case. Absolutely. So I joined the military when I was 17 years old. I was so young that my mom had to sign the papers in order for me to go. Oh. I went in the military on a lie. There was a question at the time, are you a homosexual? And I answered, yes. I mean, I answered no. Inside, it was yes. And so I went into the military on a lie and I lived on a lie, I lived in secret for the entire 24 years, 10 months and eight days that I served in the military. And now, mental that, health. That was don't ask, ask, don't tell, right? Yes, I retired just before don't ask, don't tell was repealed. And so I served in, a, in, in an environment where it was okay to uh, be a lesbian in secret as mm. long as I didn't tell anybody. Wow. That is really quite a journey. And so now, you know, what was the epiphany? Where, where did you finally realize that you needed to transition? Because for many years you identified as a lesbian. So when, when and you transitioned in 2018, when did you make the choice? So I retired in 2012, and that's actually when I started my mental health therapy, because being serving as a senior officer in the military, a mental health counseling was shunned upon. And mm -hmm. so I didn't start mental health therapy until 2012. And over the course of the next several years, I went through that therapy. And I actually started in 2017 therapy that was specific to my gender transition. And so I'm a mental health advocate. And I think that it's imperative that we all have mental health, but specifically if we're going through a transition like that. And so I got to a point of no return. I got to what many call rock bottom. 
And I just could not live not only in silence anymore, but I got to a point where I met suicide several times. I met, you know, uh, drinking several times. And I just got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. And I chose to live in my truth, my truth. I chose myself and I chose God. Wow. Now, now I'm thinking through that process. Then you've been through our healthcare system <laughs> and I will admit this week, I just had my first mammogram and I was anxious and, and uh, a lot of different feelings about that. Um, because as a gender non-conforming person, certain acts just make us just quite frankly feel quite uncomfortable. And when I went into the room and I was given a pink robe to put on, <laughs> It solidified my uncomfortableness even more. But I'll tell you, when I got in there, the technician handled me with care and respect. And I know that that's not always the case. Tell me, have you ever had any situations with regards to your providers or in our healthcare system where you said, boy, we got to we got to do better? Certainly. Uh, congratulations on your first mammogram. I think Thank that you. is huge. Um, I've had experiences that have not been uh, to my liking, if you will. I have to say and give a shout out to the Veterans Administration. Uh, okay. President Obama implemented some uh, policies that got us to where we are today. And so I have an amazing healthcare team at the VA. However, there are still some areas where we need a little bit of training, education, and enlightenment. And so the most uh, infrequent or most frequent times that I've experienced negativity, if you will, as it relates to my gender, gender transition has been when people are not familiar with my pronouns and my name. My pronouns are he and him. And so if the VA records are not updated, something as simple as referring to me still as ma'am or she or by my old name can trigger me and I can go right back down to that, that mental health road. So while we've come a long way in the VA system, we've got a long way to go. Exactly. And that is a theme that I hear quite frequently from many in the trans community. But on a better note, I have not read it, but I know that you've written this children's book. Now, the one thing that I know about mainstream America is that they almost review, revere the trans community as a way in a way where they don't want us near their children. Um, they're scared when trans people come around. So what was your inspiration to write this book and how do you feel like it can help on a much broader scale? I will say this. I think that anytime there is fear, then people sometimes say, I don't want my children around that. Or quite frankly, I don't want to go around that. So one of my reasons for writing this book was to dispel the fear, to reduce uh, the, the uh, myths and the misnomers around being transgender. I decided to break it down to the least common denominator, if you will, and that's the yep. mind of a child. Yeah. And so children get it. I have the most amazing family. My nieces and nephews and baby cousins inspired this book because as, as I transitioned, I didn't know how to have a conversation with them. I didn't know how to say, hey, uh, Auntie Tasha is now becoming Uncle Elijah. And so when I researched it, there were no books out there that looked like me, a black trans man. So I decided to create the resource and it's a tool not only for families, but it's a tool for the classroom. It's a tool for, for uh, parents to have table discussions. I love it. I absolutely love it and kudos to you. Now don't go anywhere, I'm gonna put you backstage um, but I want you to come back and, and uh, we'll do a wrap up at the end, okay? Absolutely, thank you. I wanna bring up my next guest. Oh, this one right here. Uh, I, I met him years ago, but I saw him originally on a documentary called The Aggressives and he has grown so much since 
that particular documentary. His name is Marquise Vilson Balenciaga, because yes, he is in the house of Balenciaga. He is a transgender actor, activist living in New York City. And you can see him currently on Netflix's new um, documentary, Disclosure, which is excellent. And it addresses how we have looked at the trans community over the years in film and television. He also has a recurring role in NBC's new television show, Blind Spot. Welcome, Marquise. Hey, thank you for having me. Oh, yes, it is an absolute pleasure. Well, you know, bringing up the Disclosure documentary, um, when I watched it, I was kind of mind boggled <laughs> at, at how trans people have been represented and misrepresented over the years. Talk to me about that cliche phrase, representation matters, and why it matters so much to you as it relates to your journey that you've been on. Well, I think to piggyback off of Dr. Elijah, right, like the creation of a book that allows you to see yourself, allows a child to see themselves, I think representation is, is exactly that when we talk about television, film, media, books, sports, politics, um, I think it's about not just seeing yourself, but also the possibility for your future. It's, it's extremely important. Absolutely, it is. And you know, you know a little something about representation because when I was um, digging, now I know we just spoke with Dr. Elijah who is a real life military vet, but you played one on TV. <laughs> And you played one on one of my favorite shows, Law and Order SVU. Tell me a little bit about how that came about. That, that specific episode um, was around uh, a sergeant in the military by the name of Jim Preston. And uh, as it have you, this in particular episode, there was a sexual assault that had taken place um, with, a, with a young white girl. And he happened to be with a group of men that actually sexually assaulted her. Um, Jim's, Jim Preston's concern was being outed, uh, potentially as a result of testifying or being involved because he hadn't shared this information with anyone in the military. Um, we need those sorts of, we need that. We need to see that imagery and it was so strong. And uh, how was the crew when you worked on that? Uh, for the most part, I had a pretty good experience, I think more specifically with the creative team. Um, unfortunately, not people who are always in hair and makeup or, you know, um, as privy or know what's going on. But the overall team, the writer's room, um, director, producers, everyone, for the most part, I had a very good experience, to be perfectly honest with you. And in fact, when that episode aired, uh, Mariska Haraktay, she called my cell phone directly to say thank you for my performance, which was very nice. Uh, but I had a good experience. And oh, also, just to ad address something really quickly, I actually did serve in the military as well, too, in real life. Ah. Uh, the, the, the relationship for me was not uh, particularly a good one. I mean, I don't mm. necessarily promote my own experience, but for me, it's, it's more about the administration. It's about this idea that somehow, as a trans person, you cannot authentically exist you know, in your own sense of self-agency and be able to do your job. And when that episode aired, in fact, it was, I want to say, a month just after the, uh, the administration 45, I'm not going to say his name, but 45 rolled out that trans ban in the military. And so the conversation was, was it was really that much more important and significant. Mm -hmm. not, yeah. not that we did not need to have that conversation in the first place. But I think that the moment that there was this attack very specifically on trans folk in the military, you know, just working on this episode at that time was like, okay, here's, here's a clap back. Right, yes, absolutely, the clap back. And yeah. I love film because it lives on and on and on. So kudos to you for being able to use your art to, um, you know, as, as, as a protest. But I know that you are actually out there in real life um, on the front lines with the Black Lives Matters uh, trans community version of that. 
Tell me a little bit about what that experience has been like. And, you know, do you feel like you're making any progress? Hmm. I don't know if I would say that, you know, progress is necessarily being made more than it is really about awareness. Okay. You know, I, I, it is really interesting to be a black person standing in the middle of two movements that are happening that meet the intersections of my identity and the communities that I come from. So the Black Lives Matter movement really centering and focusing around police brutality, but the Black Trans Lives Matter movement is really a conversation about the intra-racial violence that is experienced among the, the trans community and particularly trans women of color, definitely Black trans women experiencing violence at the hands of Black men. Yeah. Right. Like that's a really large and loaded conversation, I think, to be having. So I don't know if there's as much, quote unquote, progress in the way of it not happening as much. I mean, in the last two weeks, if I'm correct, I think we've seen at least nine black trans women murdered in the last two weeks, in addition to a black trans man that we're just finding out about who was actually murdered June 15th. Right. Right? right. So um I just feel like it's an ongoing conversation and, you know, to be actively involved in what that looks like is it's really about awareness and it is about yeah. forcing black folks to also look at ourselves, to be yes. honest about the transphobia, the homophobia, this sort of like real specific disconnect from queer plus community that says, well, we can't have this conversation right now. Yeah. Maybe y'all, y'all need to wait. Cause right now it's all black lives matter. All of us are being attacked. You're right. All those things are true. Yes. And, trans communities, specifically black trans women are being murdered at the hands of black men. You can't, you can't not have that conversation, even That's in terms right. of, of abuse of women, black women, yes. literally 92% yes. of black women, when they experience violence, trauma, sexual assault or anything, 92% of that is interracial. I mean, it's coming from black men. Right. Mm. Oh, I could hear you talk forever about this because I know that whoever is watching needs to hear it. So I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to take you backstage for a minute. And um, I hope you join us in just a few minutes for a, a wrap up. Okay. I want to bring up my next guest. And it is Dr. Kwanzaa Pinckney. Now, Dr. Kwanzaa is a nationally recognized board certified physician, but she's also a DJ. How cool is that? <laughs> and she's an advocate for music as a therapeutic adjunct to medicine with a specialized focus on brain wave music therapy, which can help you improve focus, concentration, and it might even help you with your ADHD. That's powerful. Welcome, Dr. Kwanzaa. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm just blessed to be in the building with such an amazing group of people. You know, I was happy to have you um, because you just, I love people that have so much depth. And from a mental mm -hmm. health perspective, I know that there must have been something for us to have a Dr. Kwanzaa and a DJ Code Blue, right? Talk to yeah. me a little bit about that piece of, of mental therapy through music. Well, I mean, I think it's true just to the nature of the conversation that we're having, right? We're not all one thing. We're not all one, um, one layer. And I think what I found uh, after so many years of school and so many years of just rigorous training was that, you know, I'm not just a physician. I'm also a proud lesbian. I'm also a lover of music. I'm also a DJ. And I just felt it was important for me to express those things because a lot of times in healthcare, um, as we're as we're seeing through COVID, which is a crazy experience to begin with, is that sometimes we're just locked into a bubble. And uh, you know, COVID has really shown us, um, you know, a lot of the problems in healthcare with supply chain and so on and so forth. And I, I didn't want to be locked into that, into the little matrix of being just, you know, the doc in the box. What can I say? <laughs> you are. And I need to stay out the club a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you are definitely not the doc in the box. But on a serious note, though, mm -hmm. um, you are in the medical profession. We know that medical bias exists. What do you think? What, you know, if you had to give a seminar to your, your colleagues, 
What would you say about medical bias as it relates to our folks, which is first, obviously we're black <laughs> and secondly, we're LGBTQ. What would you say? Well, I think there's a lot of conversations to be had. It's funny in uh, reviewing, you know, some of the things that we were going to be discussing today, we still are on black. I mean, to be quite honest, I mean, and so it's interesting, we haven't made much progress in terms of uh, where we are in terms of just racial dispar disparity, let alone uh, disparity based on gender or gender identification or being transgender. So the first step would be for those of us who care to be informed and educated is simply to go out and, and and talk to our colleagues to make sure that we're doing seminars, that we're doing grand rounds, that we're learning uh, proper pronouns so that we don't have to walk into sticky situations even though we might have the best intentions. It's really about education. Probably in medical school, we probably got two hours of education on uh, on, on anything related to um, any sort of bias. I mean, there's not really a lot of focus on that. Dr. Kwanzaa, uh, yeah. hold on, hold, hold the press here. <laughs> you just said, I, you know, because I know you all are in school for many, many years. And you're going to tell me that there's only about two hours that's relegated for that? Yeah, I've actually did uh, some studies on this and uh, it's about two hours uh, wow. in its entirety. It's a part of a larger conversation of ethics and, um, yeah. and those sort of conversations, but yeah. a dedicated conversation you know, probably yeah. two hours or less, unless it's something pertinent to a specific patient. Now, I'll, I'll say that I am proud to, to, to know that um, just yesterday, the Black Women's Health Imperative announced a partnership with an organization called AWAN, and they are developing a cur curriculum which will actually help healthcare professionals mm -hmm. check their biases um, as it relates to Black pregnant women post um, pre and post pregnancy. And so that is one of the things I always like to tell people when I talk about black women's health imperative, that we are constantly doing the heavy lifting and that's such a mm -hmm. heavy lift developing curriculums. But now with you saying something like that to me, I see that's really important because if that mm -hmm. can be put into the curriculum, then we can have that for another subject and another subject and another subject. Well, you have to remember too, you know, doctors, health professionals are just people. And so, you know, if we look at bias as a whole, right? So explicit would be something that you feel and then you actually mirror in real life, right? You're actually explicit with your expression of that. In medicine, most of the times it's implicit bias, which means that, you know, we may see a person not understand what to do and then have all these feelings come up. And even though outwardly we're not expressing, you know, our disdain or, or like, oh, my God, like what's going on or our lack of knowledge on this topic, um, you know, we hide that. And, right. and it's not it's not preserved. And most of the time implicit bias, especially when it comes to um lgbtq community is is oftentimes implicit because most medical professionals are like oh i would never be judgmental but it happens all the time there's a reason that in the mississippi delta uh black black uh people who are african-american have their legs cut off more than anywhere up in, anywhere else in the country and that's because wow. they don't have access Everything yeah. is about access. That's one of the biggest problems with healthcare in this country is a lack of access, lack of insurance, lack of access. People need to be getting involved with their politics. They need to be looking at what's going on with the Affordable Care Act right now with this huge repeal that just happened in the middle of Pride Month. It's disgusting, but we can go there later. Um, but there's so many things going on in the world that we can't get diluted from. And it's very important as um, as healthcare professionals, at least those of us who do care and who are informed is to really to share with other people. Um, it, it, and it's just basic. And I think basic respect um, is something that as a patient, if you're going through this, is that you can demand of your, your physician. Um, and it's that tougher in rural communities. Yeah, that was my next question actually. Mm -hmm is what can patients do? What can we do to advocate for ourselves? Right, so most of the time, and although it's an unfair burden, you have to be your own best advocate. And so oftentimes you may have to write out a little summary of exactly what your preferred pronoun is because people, we expect healthcare providers to be on, so on top of things. And I can promise you that they're not. 
um, unless they're well versed or in a community that um, has, you know, an active community. Um, uh, you can write down what medications you're on, what health conditions you're on, if you've transitioned, what medications that you're still taking so that we can guide you appropriately. And so in some ways by writing it on that piece of paper, it sort of eliminates some of that bias because you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're keeping everything sort of logical. You don't leave room for interpretation um, because that's where problems start to come in. I love that. I love that nugget right there. Write things down. So keep a, keep a health journal is what you're mm -hmm. basically saying. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. I am. And it's just so important that people understand that you know, if you cannot talk for yourself, bring somebody who can advocate for you. There, mm. there are systems in place. It was disturbing to read all the literature about how patients are being treated out here. And if we don't demand better, we will not get better. And so we have to keep ourselves informed, know who the supervisor is. There's always a supervisor for the nurse. There's always a supervisor for a doctor. And if it's a private practice, you can go somewhere else if you're not getting the care that you rightfully deserve. And Thank then tell you. all your friends about it on social media. Yeah. Yes, social media always. That gets people's reactions. I'm I'm so amazed at how when somebody posts something on social media that the actual company, you know, will reply because they don't want the uh, negative press. So Correct. thank you for that last nugget as well. Okay, Dr. Kwanzaa, I'm going to send you to backstage for just a minute, but we want you to come back, and um, I'm going to bring up my next guest, who I have known for years and who is a native of Atlanta, and I just adore Miss Lawrence. Miss Lawrence is actually, I, I, I forget this, you know, that you're a hairstylist by trade. Former, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, an activist, an actor, a uh, reality star. I mean, you have been the gamut and excelled at all of them. Um, your last uh, uh, stint at, on that amazing critically acclaimed star, honey, uh, Miss Bruce was giving it to them and we loved you for it. Thank it's good you. to see you. You good, good to see you too, Lisa, thank you. Absolutely. Now, you know, I was looking at an interview you did recently and I, first of all, I was just so proud of this moment for you and Fat Joe to do that. So that was number one, Fat Joe, interviewed Miss Lawrence on um, his new show recently. And, you know, I just felt like that's what we need. <laughs> we yeah. need that intersectionality going on there. Yeah. And um, you said that, you know, Fat Joe was like, hey, you know, when did you know you were gay? And you said, hey, baby, I came out gay with lipstick on. <laughs> yes, oh yes. <laughs> and, I, and I love that because you know there are still some people who think that you know it's this argument of nature versus nurture and it makes me think about this whole uproar over Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union and the way they are raising Zaya yeah what would you tell you know the naysayers what would you say to them having been that kid what would you say to them about you know how people should raise their young trans and LGBTQ kids? You know, it's interesting. When I did that interview with Joe, um, which is not the first time I've had to talk about uh, Dwayne Wade and Gabby and um, their daughter, Zaya. Um, but every time that I'm asked about it and asked, the, the main question is, do you think it's too early for them mm -hmm. to allow for mm. them to allow mm. their daughter Zaya to identify as trans. And my question back is always, well, what, what, what is a, when is a better time? No. Tell me when is a better time. And, no. and I, as I said in my interview with Joe, I think most people, uh, I don't, I think most people, parents especially, um, I don't think it's about when the right time is. I think it becomes a, a, a question for themselves and how they feel people will look at them and their family. And it, it, it then becomes less about the child and about them. And a lot of, a lot of people love to refer to uh, the Bible when it okay. comes to um, gender non-conforming kids, black gay kids. Um, and you know, it's so funny. And, I just think that they use it as a very 
easy way out. Yes. This very false idea that the Bible speaks against who we are as spiritual beings, which it does not. I think people have interpreted the way that the word is to make themselves comfortable. And if you are really, really about the word and the way that you interpret it, then you wouldn't do anything, Ugh. anything wrong that goes against what the word of God says or what the Bible says. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of work that has to be done in yeah. families. Um, there is no blueprint uh, for parenting. Right. But what I will say, what I think is very easy, but very hard at the same time, is to teach your children to lead with love, to yeah. lead with self-awareness. And if you want to go biblical, if you want to, you know, be this spiritual uh, leader for your children, it's very simple. You teach them to thine own self be true. Mm. And to thine own self be true is not what makes you comfortable. It may make you very uncomfortable, but they're being true to who they are. That is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Sorry, I love so, wine. I have to drink so, it. so, you know, when you, when you think about the impact that you've had and, and your friends have had, I know that a lot of you all do have straight friends. Um, how important is it for you, do you think, that we get outside of our little gay LGBTQ bubble and cross the aisles and, and make sure that we are interacting more and have more straight friends and vice versa? Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's funny. I've always had a lot of um, cis friends and heterosexual friends, and I think it's, it's very it's okay to be friends with people that may not fully understand who you are. Right. I think it's important that they fully respect who you are and that they, um, and that they honor who you are and who you feel you've been called here to be. And yep. when we think about, or what I think about uh, today, as I was reflecting today on the life of Congressman John Lewis, who's a real, Whoa. real, uh, champion and hero for civil rights, human rights, gay rights, you yes. name it. Yes. Um, people like him set a real example of what it means to not see gender, not see color, not right. see uh, who you choose to love when you're looking at someone and wanting to embrace them and love them. And I think at the center of every major movement, from the civil rights era to the gay rights era. We have always been there. We've That's always true. been there, yes. We've always championed for our heterosexual cis brothers and sisters. You yes. know, when yes. they hurt, we hurt, yep. you know? And um, I don't think it's a, I don't, I don't think it's a, a bad thing to be friends or, you know, to have relationships with people that are cisgender or heterosexual, what have you. I think that further, uh, normalize the idea that we can coexist and that we can love each other um, and take care of one another as we are assigned to do. When That's we right. come into this place, when we come, when we're born, we are here by assignment to love, to, um, to, to serve and to heal the sick. That is all of our assignment. It is not to judge one another. It is uh. to do just that. And I think if people fully understood that and actually practiced it. Um, I don't think we would live in a world that we live in today that is led a lot by greed and hate. Oh, you, and that brings up my last question for you. Um, right before COVID-19, one of our ATLN uh, residents, Atlanta rapper, Pastor Troy made the headlines because he was in an uproar after having first seen Little Nas X at one of the awards shows in this pink outfit. And um, he went in and he said, they love to push this S-H-I-T on our kids. He also recounted an incident at Applebee's. He said the other day at Applebee's had some punks kissing and laughing, eating mozzarella sticks. 
He said, first thing my 14 year old son said was F Applebee's. Get this. And it brought joy to my heart. Mm. He said he sees it, their agenda to take masculinity from men, black men especially. Now, what would you say to our cisgendered community that says that there is a gay agenda at play in this country? You know, again, as I just said, when you, when you think about the uh, civil rights era, the way we've always fought for just basic human rights. Yes. Um, we've been a part of that. Yeah. We were there from, you know, the, the Bayer Rustins, of course, Bayer Rustin, yes. Johnson, um, people like our allies, Congressman John Lewis, who's gone. We've always been there. We've been a part of the evolutions and the changes. Now, what happened was, I think, is that when we got to where we were going, and we still have a, a, a long way to long go. I think when we got to where we were going, somehow we were left, meaning people of the LGBTQ experience, were left out of the equation when it comes to mm -hmm. real civil rights and human rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that we there's a gay agenda, and I've heard that, oh, Obama did so much, but y'all got everything, da 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 We just playing catch up. Right, we're playing catch up, literally, and we it's always and it's wanted crazy. to marry who we saw, thank who we you, loved, and and and, yeah. and and all those. We are just literally playing catch up. There is no gay agenda. Yep, That's I did a TED talk last year, and the focus of it was the fact that the Supreme Court had not yet given us um, rights in the workplace. Yeah, and that. In any city in, in the state of Georgia, except for Atlanta, last year, not 20 years ago, last year, in almost any city in the state of Georgia, except for Atlanta, it was legal to discriminate against you in the workplace if you were LGBTQ right. last year. Right. So, <laughs> so if, 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 yeah. that, if they classify that as a gay agenda, yes. I will say yes, but I will say that the gay agenda has always been to keep gay people held back. Mm. So what I would love to call it or, or reimagine it as dismantling mm. the original gay agenda. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's yes. how I want to look. That's how I look at it. You know? There we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, you're staying around for a little bit longer. Yeah. I'm going to bring you back okay. and I want to introduce someone that I met at Atlanta Pride last year. She came to our Pure Heat Community Festival stage and just lit it up. And I said, I already loved her, but I said, oh my gosh, her spirit is incredible. And she's out here actually trying to preach to these people at this event. And I want to bring up Angelica Ross. She is an actress. She is an activist. But what you probably did not know is that she is a self-taught computer coder, okay, who went on to become the founder and CEO of Trans Tech Social, which is a firm that helps employ transgender people in the tech industry. Welcome, Angelica. Thank you for having me. Oh, so excited to have I've you. I've been doing a lot of talking, so my voice is a little, you know, raspy right now. But <laughs> we, this is what we're working with today. That's okay. You're giving me Miss Candy right now. Yes. <laughs> I love it. You know, I recently watched this episode of uh, Black Women who owned the conversation on the OWN Network. And it was a powerful episode. You were on it. You brought your mother on it. And you talked about your coming out story. Um, it hit so hard because I know in the black community, this issue is so prevalent. Can you just share a little bit of that with us tonight? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, what I like to say is that my story is sometimes, well, many times, not that much different than many Black LGBTQ folks. And, you know, what is common about all of our Black families is that we're all trying to pass down the best blueprint for surviving in an environment that is run by mostly like race, a racist society, white supremacy. And so as we're handing down that blueprint, your parents are saying, so when your kids are starting to tell you who they are, and it's like, well, mommy, I want to be, um, I want to be a dinosaur, but no, we can't be a dinosaur in this right. world. You know, you can't do that. So it's, it's like, well, when you want to be a singer and I want to be this and I want to be that. And you start hearing the odds. They start telling you what the, your chances mm-hmm. are at success mm-hmm. if you do these things. Your best bet is to do X, Y, and Z. So then when you start to say, well, I'm gay or I'm trans or I'm this, they're like, why would you want to put one more mm-hmm. strike against you? Are you nuts? Like, why would you choose to do this? It's already hard being black. And so there's just a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, of one, that being LGBTQ is not a choice. Right. That it's not something that white people do, that in therapy, like no therapy and um, identities are for all people. Um, And that also this is an opportunity for us as family units, as brothers, as cousins, as, you know, anyone who's close to anyone who comes out and or invites you into their lives, to the authenticity of their lives. It's an opportunity to be the first person to show them something different. Yes, absolutely. Oh, it really is. And you have been out there doing just that. And that really brings up my next question is that, you know, there was an alarming statistic I recently found out that over 90% of trans people have felt discriminated against in the work workplace. Now I want to repeat that 90%, okay? And, you know, you understood the dire connection between mental, physical health and our workplace. And what did you do to help combat this? Well, I I founded Trans Tech um, and, you know, Yeah, it's just one of those things where, unfortunately for many of us, we have to uh, resort to various economies in order to to survive, uh, street economies. Um, And that's just not unique to trans people. You know, it's a lot of black people who don't sort of fit the respectability politics of this country understand, you know, what what it's like to um, kind of be up against such um, statistics, employment Mm -hmm. statistics when it comes to being a person of color. So I wanted to create a system that for me supports anybody regardless of what their aspirations, their skills, their gifts are. Um, If your gifts are in sex work, okay, girl, I just don't want you to get beat up while you're doing it. I don't want you to be in the line of danger. So maybe with the help of technology, we can get you behind a computer screen or we can get you to be able to screen clients better or we can get you to be able to um, learn how to do a subscription to your website and things like that. Um, To folks who go into coding and to graphic design or to doing a podcast, being a YouTuber, doing video and television production. Um, There's just illustration. Um, Everything that we do now pretty much involves technology. So my advice to everyone right now is kind of just get about the business of finding about finding out about what you're passionate about yes what you're good at yeah. and then be great at it become mm. great at something and then when you're great at that tech the technology um you know will be a catalyst to sort of help you in that venture as mm. well as that is how you advocate because being an advocate is definitely not a job that pays I can tell you that a lot of people in this panel can kind of tell you that it's not a, it's not a consistently paying job. Sometimes, you know, they, they pay you for the token. Sometimes you get that, but what it's about is being successful because people want to hear from someone who's made it, who's overcome 
the challenges specific to That's your right. intersections of identity. So yeah. whatever they are, let it be an example of success. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I mean, you have done the work and, you know, not to knock anybody who hasn't, but kudos to you for that. And um, let's segue to this, the, the, the front end of, of that, which is, you know, I spoke with Marquise earlier about the Black Lives Matter movement and how America is really coining the phrase that racism is a public health crisis, right? But I would venture to say that the Trans Lives Matter movement is a public crisis that you may agree with that statement. Um, why do you feel, you know, that transphobia is something that has to be included in the Black Lives Matter um, conversation? Simply put, because we're human. Yeah. And actually this conversation is getting a little ridiculous because mm. um, we're trying to figure out at what point is any of this acceptable? Mm. Uh, well, we're well beyond the point of unacceptable. And so, um, you know, when it comes to saying Black Lives Matter, I mean, I know one thing, you can't change the fact that I'm Black. <laughs> so like, uh, I know I'm included in that. Right. Um, and I'm kind of getting to a point right now where I'm about to be some of y'all's worst nightmare. Oh, okay. I'm about to be some of y'all's worst nightmare. No, because there are just so many folks within um, black spaces who are really acting like the white people of our community. Oh. And they're behaving in ways where as black people, we're looking at white people who are saying, oh my God, not my America. I can't believe, I've never, are you sure this is going on and all this? And we looking at them like, Wait a minute, where you been? Where have meanwhile, you been? meanwhile, Kevin Hart, uh, Hill Harper, yeah, I'm calling y'all all out by name. Ooh. It's a list of y'all that are um gaslighting the hell out of us as mm -hmm. LGBTQ people and acting like we don't know. Oh, I don't know what y'all saying. It's just everybody, no, no, let's not do this. Let's not act like we didn't all grow up in the same churches, in the same households, at the same kitchen tables with the same sort of things that were passed out. Let's not. So let's just start from a place to understand that either all Black Lives Matter or we will drag you to the promised land. Mm -hmm. Like you, you won't just get to get there skipping on the back on the works of all the work that Black trans people and all of us are doing. Yeah. You, if it's costing us, it'll, it'll cost you. You're going to get dragged. So you might not, that Netflix can't, uh, special that might get canceled Ooh. until you learn how to um, play nice with all of us. Gotcha. Woo. Oh my goodness. Now I could talk to you forever. We've only got a few minutes left. I want to bring everyone back out again and just get some last thoughts from you. Um, there's a lot to unpack and we couldn't most certainly unpack it in one hour. But Dr. Elijah, tell me what your final thoughts are tonight. My final thoughts are, um, you know, I wanted to to be here so I could help um, dispel the toxic masculinity that mm -hmm. exists. I think that it's important when we talk about healthcare that our masculine identified women, our trans men, I think that is so huge for us to be invited to this table because mm -hmm. the reality is for me, I still have female anatomy. So I still have to yeah. go to the GYN. And what I wanna say is to, to, to my siblings that it's okay to go to the doctor, mm -hmm. please get yourself checked out. Yes. Go to your physical exams, get your breast exams, get your annual exams, because that that is what is going to save your life and make the, the world better for all of us. Oh, thank you, Dr. Elijah, for that. Uh, Marquise, what final thoughts do you have for me? Uh, I guess I could definitely echo with what Elijah is talking about, I think for masculine presenting folk, there's been this sort of assumption that 
And in order for you to be bred as masculine in the first place, you can't take care of yourself. I, I mean, beyond just, you know, physical health, right? Like going to an OBGYN is an, exa is an example. If you're a trans masculine or a female assigned person at birth, that's like one example of it versus maybe something as simple as like, I don't know, getting a manicure and a pedicure. <laughs> this idea, I mean, let's be honest, right? Like this idea that somehow you're less masculine if you care about yourself, if you care about your body, but if you do care about yourself and you care about your communities, you'll do the thing of taking care of not just you, which then allows you to take care of others, so. Yeah, absolutely. Ms. Lawrence, I'm going to, I'm going to, I got a question here that I'm going to read here on the screen. How can we get more black LGBTQIA plus voices and perspectives heard as opposed to the white privileged mainstream LGBTQ voice? Woo! Jesus. Um, you, you are packing, you making us unpack a lot at the end here. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. And yeah. what I will say is when I talk about it, when we talk about um, having our brothers and sisters of the same hue, of our mm -hmm. hue, our mothers and fathers, um, having our backs, mm -hmm. whether you're in the heterosexual community or the gay community, having our backs, and when you see there is a lack of representation of us, we need you to speak up because you have a straight privilege that yeah. we don't have. And so we need you. Yeah. We, while I am so honored to be a part of such a dynamic panel of people and you yourself, Lisa, uh, for hosting this um, and, and the Black Women's Health uh, Initiative, we cannot continue to have panels where we're just talking to each other. That's we right. already know what each other's struggles, which what each other's struggles are. I don't come from the trans experience, but I know it. Yeah. My trans sisters and brothers have become trans, but they understand what my struggle as a gender nonconforming person is and what it has looked like growing up here in the South in a Bible Belt state where you just pointed out that only in Atlanta, mm -hmm. only in Atlanta were we protected from discrimination in the workplace, in the medical fields. Mm -hmm. And so we can't continue to have these side conversations with just each other. Right. Yeah. We need those that may be on other panels. During this Black Women's Health Conference, we need the ones that I've seen on the other flyers. We need to all have a group discussion. We need to speak as a family and talk to each other as a family, because as we've yep. always learned since we were little, oh, we're stronger in numbers. Right. We got to have each other. Are you my brother's keeper? I'm my sisters, my mother, my brothers. I'm about to cuss. I'm sorry. My sisters, <laughs> my brothers, my daughters, my sons, my nieces, my nephews. I am everybody's keeper. Hi, and I just ask that we as a community of powerful black people that we have each other's back. Yes, and yes. if we do yeah. that, if we are able to have the, 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 the powerhouses in the black straight community to speak up on our behalf, when they see, when people like this lady that just asked this question, when you see that there is a lack of representation from black LGBTQ people in high spaces, speak up for us. Yeah. We have this whole, cancel culture thing oh. that we started, let's use it. Even if that means using it for the chastisement of our own people, mm -hmm. use it. Wow. It's only so much that we can do on our and own. There it is. And having this conversation with just us, it's great. It's great. It's further in acknowledging what we already know about each other. It's further um, edifying the fact that we love each other. Yes, it's doing all of that. And that is important. But, 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 what, but, community. but we have to take this right here. Yeah. We have to take this right here across the aisle. Well, you know, Miss Lawrence, that's why it was very important as I was working with the Black Women's Health Imperative, which has been an organization yes. that was founded by someone in the LGBTQ community that, but our base is much broader. So that's that. why 
I, 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 that's why I said, we've got to have a panel with people that they're not used to seeing. Right. And so hopefully we have actually tonight tapped into people where we are not preaching to only the choir right. because right. yeah, that's, I feel you. I feel you on that one. And thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And to the Black Absolutely. Women's Health um, Organization. Thank you. Dr. Kwanzaa, talk to me. Man, y'all got me fired up over here. I'm like, let's go do something. What <laughs> we need another Where are we rolling to? Huh? Yeah, we do. We need, man, look, I'm, I'm just saying y'all are amazing. And I'm grateful to be on this panel. And I think for anybody who's watching, who's struggling, um, you know, if you are in a healthcare provider, you have a duty to, to, to treat people with love. I love what you said, um, Ms. Lawrence, about just about treating people with love and respect and kindness and, and understanding that we're just one big human spirit. And if we can do that, I think we'll start to get more things right. And then if not, we just don't have to get loud and angry and, and do what we got to do because you see that works. And then also, I don't want to downplay the, the message of economics. If mm. there was there would be more surgeries being offered to people if it paid out more. And it's very mm. important that we that we look at the economics of medicine and that has been displayed during the COVID epidemic or pandemic, I should say. So I know we, we only got a short matter of time, but there's so many things I wish we could touch on, but I'm just so grateful to be here with you guys. And anytime y'all want to shake it up, I'll let you grow. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Miss Angelica. Yeah. Tell you know, me. I just, I just want to say when speaking of sort of economics, economic empowerment, as well as health. I am here in the great state of Georgia and where there's just so many black people and black entrepreneurs and everything. And there's this, there's this sort of illustration of freedom here mm. in Atlanta. Mm. But um, I just, sometimes we get so complacent within a movement when we get things and when we get what seems like might be our 40 acres in a mule Ooh. and we're good huh. or whatever the case is. But in Atlanta, if we want to call this a black Hollywood, how are we going to call this a black Hollywood when in the other Hollywood, they're not being arrested for smoking weed. They're actually making money off of it. Yeah. When there's all of this money sitting in Atlanta on all of these black celebrities and you're telling me y'all are not advocating for the legalization of marijuana when it would Ooh. economically not only help us as a community, uh. but it would free so many of our cousins and our um, people that ain't working in the business, that don't ain't protected behind the gated communities. So let's have a real conversation about liberation here in Atlanta. I'm ready for it. And across you know, the country, yeah. And I'm proud to sit on the mayor, uh, along with Ms. Lawrence, on the mayor's LGBTQ <laughs> advisory board here in Atlanta. And I will say this about Atlanta once again, is that we finally decriminalized, yeah. <laughs> you know, marijuana where it's, 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 um, you know, a misdemeanor. It's a misdemeanor event. now, yeah. Yeah. And so other- Meanwhile, people are still making money off of it. I just want to, it's 2020 and there's two right. different realities going on. And John Boehner, who was our former representative speaker of the house is now talking about buying and selling stock in marijuana, oh, what yeah. is really going on people? Yeah. Like I'm done, I'm done y'all playing in our faces. Yeah, but that's also you black cis men and women too. I'm done y'all playing in our faces. We are gonna start calling the thing a thing and we're gonna get to the freedom line together. We're gonna do it, we are gonna heal, Beyonce. <laughs> That, well, you know what? That ends it right there, is that we are eventually going to heal. I know that when John Lewis, he was mentioned earlier today and I know many of us tuned in for his funeral. One of the last remarks he made um, when he went to the Black Lives Matter mural in DC. So up to the end now, I want everybody to know that up mm. to the end, he was in the fight, right? Mm. And so that is our challenge tonight. And, our, and I, I want to implore everyone to just stay in the fight. But up to the end, he said, we will get there. Mm. And so we've got to make sure that we are able to live out, um, you know, his, his dream because we're left here and a lot of us have influence and I, and I, and I see it on the Instagram pages, you know, of all of us and, and how we're able to have people make moves and do things. So we have to be very careful about how we're moving out here. And as Miss Lawrence said, we have to lead with love. 
Thank you to everyone who came and who watched tonight. On behalf of the Black Women's Health Imperative, I would like to tell you good night and be vigilant. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure thing. I'll share. Y'all have a good night. Be safe.